to start now. So uh, before, <clears throat> just to quickly introduce myself and a few administrative issues. So my name is Amit Binderman. I'm the CEO of Cometa Bio. Uh, we're the sponsors of this, uh, this webinar. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to see uh, a lot of people here already. We are up to 80 already uh, on this call. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you if you can keep your microphones and cameras muted uh, during the lecture. It's going to really help the quality of, um, of the streaming. Um, of course, you can use the chat window on the side if you click on chat and where you can post, uh, where you can post your questions. Uh, we're going to do our best to answer these questions as we go, but uh, we'll, at the end of the lecture, uh, the end of the presentation, we will take questions and answers, and hopefully we can uh, we can address uh, most of them. Um, also, if you can like us, like our Facebook page, and also check out our website, cometabio.com. Okay, so today uh, we will talk about what else? We'll talk about autologous dentin. Uh, we'll talk about autologous dentin as an effective and safe alternative uh, to bone grafting. And I know no better person to talk about this topic than Professor Nelson Pinto. Uh, just to introduce my dear friend here, uh, Dr. Uh, Pinto is a professor at the Department of Periodontics and Implant Dentistry at the University of the Andes in Santiago, Chile. He's a visiting professor at the Department of Oral Health Science, Periodontology, University Hospitals, Catholic University in Leuven, in Leuven, Belgium. He is the founder and chairman of the Research Center for Regenerative Medicine and Tissue Engineering in Concepcion, Chile, a leading expert on clinical applications of LPRF in soft and hard tissue regeneration and wound healing. He's got an active pra private practice specializing in advanced implant dentistry. Uh, we already stopped counting how many national, international podium engagements, lectures and conferences and courses in implant dentistry and tissue regeneration Nelson has given us, um, way over 300, carries multiple awards in clinical oral research. Nelson, uh, I think more uh, above anything else is a true healer. Uh, he's constantly pushing the envelope when it comes to tissue regeneration and healing concepts and a wonderful friend. So, uh, Nelson, without further ado, we'll transfer over the share to you and we can begin. Okay, uh, thank you, Amit, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to see you at least on the screen. And uh, as we said before, missing all the time that we have spent together in the past and looking forward to, to get back to, to the old times in the, in the near future as soon as possible. Uh, Thank you for all the attendees for for giving the time to to, to you know take this time and uh, be with us and uh, and share this uh, about an hour that we will talk about uh, autologous dentin and I think the the question I put on the title uh, that is autologous dentin a real and safe alternative to bone grafting uh, it's I think it it shows what what is uh, up to date because uh, it's a um, it shows that is a is a lot of myth behind this. There is a lot of uh, misunderstanding. There is a lot of lack of information, and I hope I will address in this short time uh, some of those aspects and also. Uh, I would like you to to really take a look at this. Uh, this is not something uh, really new. This has been around for some time. And uh, I hope during this presentation, I will uh, address some of the 
doubt that most of the people have in this field and I hope uh, I will clarify most of them. Before I start, I will always like to thank my, my group. This is my university uh, of Los Andes in Santiago, Chile. Uh, my nice group of colleagues and friends at the perio and implant department. Of course, my other group of friends and uh, colleagues at K11 University in Leuven, my best partner, and uh, my best partners, that's, I would say, uh, during all my life and uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm here today for many, many things that I don't have time to, to say, but many people know about this and I, I really thank my horses for uh, giving me the opportunity to share this knowledge with all of you. And today is a special day. I would like to uh, dedicate this, if you allow me to this this lecture to my uncle, Dr. Alcides Pinto Miranda. He couldn't uh, won the fight against this virus. So this 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 virus that is affecting all of us. Uh, he took uh, my uncle away. He passed away yesterday. Couldn't won the fight, but he was a fighter. So I I know he will be fighting. Uh, somewhere else and uh, I know he would enjoy this this lecture so this lecture was, was for him okay um, back to the topic we deal with uh, many many uh, complications and many challenging cases in, in the industry whatever you go every every congress every meeting you will see a lot of uh, challenging cases. But uh, most of them uh, sometimes are, you know, out of your, we would say, difficult to treat out of your hands or uh, it will be extremely difficult to handle it. And uh, I will, I've been always searching for something that, you know, it's reachable for everyone and anyone can do it. So, even in the most challenging cases, if you get the good training and you get the good information and knowledge, I know you will be successful if you do simple things. And that's why my focus of research has been always involved on going back to autologous things, autologous products, and all the biology that comes with the patient in every case. So we, hit, we see this case and you know that you have a lock of, uh, you are, you know, you need soft tissue. You need hard tissue. So how can you achieve that? How you can predictably, you know, have, treat this case and uh, have a success? Well, I, I think that this is something that is something that we need to talk in these days what I call the triad for success in modern implantology. See, we have uh, the implant uh, in this, the center of everything. And of course, we cannot do too much about that because it comes, you know, what it is. But of course, now we are getting better and better implants. And that has to do with the design and of course the surface. So how that implant interact interact with or what we do or what the patient has. So this is what I call the interaction in this triad. And first is about natural guided regeneration. You know, how you can really regenerate soft and hard tissue. How can you add biomodifiers like growth factors and cells? How can you enhance wound healing? Not really uh, with something that you will buy. It's just taking things that are coming from with your patient. Then, of course, we know that autologous bone will be the gold standard for bone graft. Okay, what would be the second? Well, today I would say the second for me will be dentin, autologous dentin for bone grafting. So. If you see here, we're still in the area of autologous. 
product. And it would see what we can get from this. Well, we can get osteoinduction, osteoconduction, and osteogenesis. So what else we need for bone grafting? Those are the three things that we are looking for. And then we go to the other uh, side on your uh, left side, osteodensification, a new concept that is changing the way that we uh, manipulate, the way that we create the site for our implants. And that preserve the bone, optimize the site, and give you, and give you a better primary stability. So if you stay inside this uh, triangle, uh, you will see that you know everything is coming from the patient, and everything that is coming from outside is just the tools and the implant that, of course, has to be in synergy with all the things that we are doing. So how will we do approach this this challenging cases? Or you can do nothing, you can do a bone graft, but what type of bone graft? Or then you think what type of membrane I'm gonna use. And you have many, many types, non-resorbable, resorbable from different origin, bovine, porcine, human, synthetic. And then you may think, well, maybe you should add, uh, as my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Pico said, you know, you need a bazooka for this. And then you add some growth factors. And then what, what type of growth factors? Uh, should I buy growth factors or should I take the growth factor from the patient? And um, what about soft tissue? We're still missing the soft tissue. Well, can we get some uh, autologous soft tissue? Are we going to get some uh, donor site or we can work just on the site to improve the soft tissue? Well, maybe the combination of all of them will be the best uh, choice to treat some of these cases. Well, I'm gonna try to show you in this a short time, of course, it's not to show you the techniques and you have to, to, to learn, you know, going through the learning curve to, to get all these uh, um, good results using only autologous things. But uh, I will stay on just autologous products. If we look for, you know, what is, how many bone grafts uh, are done in, in uh, for example, in the United States or, or how many uh, bone graft procedures are, are done? Uh, there are many, many. And uh, if we look in the literature, we can find that, you know, bone graft, it's the second most used material for biomedical therapy in the United States. And this is a kind of old study. It's almost close to blood transfusion. So let's go back to 2007, and we will see that today it's almost double. But in, the, in those days, you know, almost 275,000 procedures involved bone graft substitutes. And more than half of that were performed by periodontists. So, well, well, what we need, what we're looking for. Bone graft substitutes should be similar with, uh, in architecture and chemical composition to natural osseous tissues. And that could be allograft, xenograft, or aeroplast. So this is getting more and more complicated. And then you may think, well, we need also have to add a membrane and that would be different. So I will challenge today that in the future, maybe there will be not very specific, only a specific indications for where or when you have to use a collagen membrane, resorbable or non-resorbable or whatever type of membrane would you like. And I will show you how we, you can avoid that. And if we, we look in the market from the next or the following years, you know, up to 2025, I hope we will get that, uh, we will get to that. Uh, because uh, we should survive this virus first. And I hope we'll get back to normal. If everything gets back to normal, you can see how the bone graft procedures uh, will be increased in the dental field, just in the dental field in the future. So just in 2012, there were too many bone graft substitutes. I mean, 144. 93 allograft, 30 alloplast, uh, 21 xenograft. It's just part of summary of what was available. 
and uh, you can have in different configurations, different compositions, and of course, uh, from different origin. And you know, you can see it's a lot of combination. So this can get very confused for many people, but uh, this, this is what we have, and this is what we have been uh, using and for many years. So now let's go back to the original question. Well, what about if, can we go 100% autologous for bone graft? It means everything that we will use will, will come from the patient in a very simple way and a very minimally invasive way. So do we have to use collagen membranes? Well, that's a great topic and I will take the time to invite you this is coming soon, very soon, you know, what we call the fight that we're all wanted, you know, collagen membrane versus LPRF membrane. So let's put both on the ring and uh, see what everyone has to show and get for us. Going back to bone graft. Well, now we have teeth and uh, we used to, this is what we, this is the origin of our profession, you know, extracting teeth. And now what we, did, what we did and then all this time, just throw it away. Well, we are in the times of recycle things and uh, we are talking about going and to do a green dentistry. And maybe we can recycle this teeth and maybe they can have a value. The only tooth that I know that has a value was this one, you know, that was a, uh, uh, sold in 2011 to a Canadian dentist for about $31,000, supposed to belong to John Lennon. And even with that carious, you know, it was a very expensive tooth, but I don't think that it's any other tooth that has that value. And these are beautiful teeth that we have to extract for some time for pretty long uh, reasons sometimes for traumatic reasons. And why are we gonna throw this beautiful um, biomaterial, this beautiful structure that was made by nature? Why we cannot recycle that? Why, why, why we cannot put it back to the patient? And by the way, patient, we love it. And uh, if you tell them, you know, I can extract your teeth, and I can put it back and they will create something better or good for you. Patient will love it. So just to show you a few publications that we have done in this field, uh, we just published this uh, last, last year, uh, combining autologous particulate denting with LPRF and uh, liquid habinogen to create a matrix for predictable risk preservation. So this is uh, something that we do uh, as a model of risk preservation for us. Uh, we, always, we only place LPRF as a soil graft and you, the people that know me uh, knows about that. But when you want to study, uh, if you would like to study a biomaterial, risk preservation is a wonderful model to do that because it gives you the opportunity to get back to the patient, to get some uh, histology samples and to really prove the concept. So we have used dentin, uh, not just for, uh, just to prove the concept on, uh, on risk preservation, but we also for horizontal lamentation. And we just present this, uh, I think it was uh, last year, um, at CEPA meeting in, in Spain. And this is one of my students, Dr. Martin and Cajan. And he did a wonderful job. And he proved that, you know, he was using uh, autologous dentin to cover the, the hisses at the time of placing implant and to do some horizontal augmentation. So this is part of the data. And uh, you can see that uh, it will show you better later uh, some more histology, but you can see that using uh, autologous dentin, you can get a very nice result 
going from this uh, uh, condition on the left to the one that you have on the right where you place the implant. And of course, you were, should expect a dehiscence or some kind of uh, complication on the buccal aspect. And then you place your graft that is dented. And after three months, you can see that this is becoming new bone. So we can do that. I will show you at the end uh, what we have done in the sinus too. So can LPRF going back to natural thing because we, we are adding things, you know? Now we have the biomaterial. Now we need something else and that's called LPRF. So can LPRF literally replace the biomaterial that we are using today for heart and soft tissue regeneration? Well, I'm today at the point that I can say absolutely yes. So in many situations, we can do that. I'm not saying, I make, wanna make that very clear, that we, this is gonna replace everything and we are not gonna use biomaterials anymore. No, that absolutely not. But I can say that in many, many procedures, we can only go 100% autologous and we don't need anything else. And just to be sure of that, and just to, to give you some uh, perspective on that, uh, just to show you that uh, other people are doing the same thing and we are getting great recognition for uh, great organizations like the European Federation of Periodontology and you can see here from last year LPRF a dream or the future of bone regeneration and from the EAO and Lisbon 2019 you know how to treat cases involving buccal bone loss after extraction and you can see here the LPRF solution it was given my, my very good friend, uh, Marc Corrini from Belgium. And as, uh, another recognition from the EFP, European Federation of Periodontology, you know, our work clinical research 2018, the LPRF block concept. And again, uh, last year, uh, for two years in a row, uh, the European Prize for Clinical Innovation and Implant Dentistry with the LPRF blood concept. And also we won the best cell biology for the contest. And you can see in the last issue from October, 2019, the clinical oral implant research, the cover of the issue, you can see uh, the LPRF uh, picture of the electron microscope. So that though, uh, is trying to put together and to show you that this is not something that I do, uh, and this is not something that just a few people can do, this is something that anyone can do, and it's very well scientifically proven, and it's uh, science-based. So the LPRF block is a, is a concept, uh, has been published, the proof of concept in uh, the Journal of Clinical Period in uh, 2018, and 2019, when the characterization of the LPRF block, the release of growth factors, cellular content and structure. And just to show you very fast, how can you make an LPRF block that it looks like maybe people know this as a, as a, um, a sticky bone, a steak bone, or, or wagulate bone, or whatever you want to name it, but just the only difference about this is this is a specific protocol. And if you follow the protocol, you should get what we are saying and you should get the result of what we are proposing. So you extract the liquid fibrinogen, you keep it in the syringe. Then you make your LPRF membranes. You take two membranes and that will give you uh, an amount of membranes, chop it or cut it in small pieces that you can make, mix with a 0.5 gram of biomaterial. Could be autologous dentins, could be bone, autologous bone, could be uh, some kind of uh, bios or any biomaterial that, of your choice. But in this case, we will use dentin. If you don't know the weight, you can uh, estimate the, the volume. So one to one in the ratio will be the volume. So then you have the you have your LPRF and then you have your dentin, you mix both together, and then you add the liquid fibrinogen. 
and a very short time, no more than 15 to 20 seconds, this should coagulate and should give you a mixture and a very solid kind of biomaterial like gummy beers, uh, let's say with intrinsic memory tape, you have like one minute to shape it. I don't have the time to, to go over that, but you can pre-shape these blocks in advance if you wanna put it in, in place. What is the benefit of doing this? Well, first one, you get all the particles uh, like glue it together, covered by fibrin and connected each other. And in between, also you, as you can see here and the electron microscopy studies, uh, you can see the spaces in between each particles where will be, uh, that will allow the possibility to get all the new irrigation and to have all uh, the new cells that will have to come to this site and start to do and create the extracellular matrix and then to create the new bone or to replace this particle by new bone, depending on what type of graft do you have. So here you ha have some examples and um, how can you cut this LPRF dentin block in this case. You can use it for sinus leaf. If you don't place the implant at the same time of, that you do your sinus leaf, you have to do some kind of, you have to use some kind of biomaterial. If you can place the implant at the same time, you can only put LPRF there, no need to put anything else. And on the right, you can see a pre-shaped uh, piece or a pre-shaped block that is, will adapt it, was pre-shaped outside and you can use this 3D model. So today we have technology to do this. So you can have the right piece of block and you just place it, adapt it in the site. And how are you gonna cover that? Well, we used to, to use a collagen membrane for that. We don't do that anymore. And we only use LPRF membrane. And sometimes when you use dentin, you don't even do, need anything because uh, that's something that will, uh, will be coming soon. It's, uh, dentin is a, it behaves in a very specific, very unique way in how it creates bones. So the LPRF block concept also here, you have the study, uh, what did you get from that combination? Or what type of graph factor do you get? And uh, you get all the growth factors that we know. Mainly, there are many, many growth factors that are involved in this. This is just a small uh, top of the iceberg of all the growth factors and all the biochemicals and all the biology that is going on. And when you know we need to, to create bone, or the the body is creating bone. So, uh, but we, we need to know what is there. And what I like to uh, get your attention is on the, your right. You need one of the most important growth factors that is BEGF. So if you look on the right, you can see when you do your bone graph, when your bone block or the, the, the LPRF bone block or dentin block, you get a lot of BEGF. Also, we went and tested, uh, what about BMP? Well, the release of BMP1, BMP2, BMP7, BMP9, we tested, they are all there. And some people would say, well, that's not the amount that we want, this is not the bazooka we want. Well, who said that you need a bazooka when you, have, when you use this type of technology or when you have uh, LPRF involved in, in this. Well, that shows that uh, we still don't know many things because if we look at this growth factor release and we study the membrane, LPRF membrane, the LPRF exudate, the liquid fibrinogen and the block, well, we can see how, how many things we are putting in the side. If we see the cells content, we can see how many million cells we are putting in the site that were not there before, that were not 
be able to get there just by a regular coagulation, we will, they will not be there if we don't mix it this way. Because if you put just biomaterial, that's what you put there. You, you don't put any of these cells, any of these growth factors. So what would be the another benefit? If we look for the micro CT analysis of this block, well, look at this. In this ratio, the content of your block is just less than 40% of biomaterial. So all the rest, 60% or more, is just fibrin, just cells, just blood at the end of the day. And if you mix it with bios, if you mix it with minerals, or you mix it with dentin, you still have that proportion, that proportion, less than 40% or just average 40%, but 60% or more is just fibrin. And that creates a lot of bone. Even some people say that LPF has nothing to do with creating bone or induced bone formation. Well, for me, that's not true. Anyway, LPF create bone, no doubt, period. LPRF membrane, the LPRF concept, you can see if you mixture, we have published the LPRF subblock concept, the LPRF cartilage block concept, and the LPRF hard block concept. And it's just the way that you mixture. And remember that when we say LPRF means we are using just blood of the patient. You can use it alone. You can mix it with cartilage, but we, we only use this in, in, uh, in plastic surgery, don't use it in dentistry. But the hard block, you can use it dentin, minerals, bios, whatever uh, biomaterial is your choice. But for me, first choice is autologous bone, second would be dentin, then minerals, and at last would be bios. So this create this concept of LPRF block, and this is how they look like. And we also have at the end, what we call the super block that comes on one side with the LPRF membranes attached to it and, and just in one piece. And this is what it uh, looked like, the LPRF super block. So just to show you, and remember that you can use this in any type of, of GBR procedures. And you can find all the guidelines, how to use this in this consensus or, or this guideline that we have uh, created and they can be loaded. And uh, from uh, this website, they are in, uh, I think so far, six different languages. Uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Turkish, Russian, and um, I don't know, there are a couple of more that are, are coming. You can download it for free from this uh, website and all the publications that we have and all the information that we are updating can be downloaded from this uh, website. So feel free to go there, it's all free. So let's go back to the LPRF dating block concept uh, and how we can use it. You can see, you can take the block with all the biomaterial, with all your dentin, with all your fibrin directly to the side, and there is no particles missing or going around. So I will show you a case. This is a typical case, extraction of the molar that uh, uh, is hopeless and uh, has a bad prognosis and has to be extracted and there is not much bone. You can see there is a buckle plate missing here and very close to the sinus. So we can do many things and we can do nothing. And of course, uh, in this case, just for academic purposes, we are gonna do some risk preservation with the LPRF dentin block. So we get our LPRF and then, um, I hope you are seeing this video uh, sometime. It's a, problem on this uh, webinar to see a very uh, good quality video, but uh, we're gonna extract the third molar. 
And we're not gonna use that third motor to put it back as a bone graph in the first molar where we're gonna do the extraction. Of course, we can mix it with the first molar too, and we can get more bone graph, and we can save that bone graph for the future for the same patient. We use this uh, small device, have this chamber where you put your clean tooth that is already dry and in just three seconds and 20 seconds of uh, you know uh, separating the particles within 300 to up to 1200 microns and very short time just before one minute you get this raft that if you, I don't tell you that is a graph that is coming from a tooth, probably you would you know, see or think that is any type of uh, graph that you can buy today from any company that produce this type of graph. Yeah. The other question comes now, well, what happened with this tooth that maybe is infected, maybe has uh, some infection, outside, inside, it's, it comes with an area with periodontitis, where maybe it was an abscess there. So how do you can, how you can clean it? Or how can you disinfect it really? How, if you wanna put this, you know, to a large graph, a sinus graph, you want, would you would like to have a very sterile material? Well, uh, I will show you in a couple of seconds the answer to that. And so just finish this case. And uh, there is a, just to mention, there is a, a chemical disinfection kit that uh, comes with the uh, material with this uh, grinding machine from Cometa Bio. You, can, you, you get the disinfection kit. It's based on uh, alcohol and a very basic alcohol uh, mixture. And, and then you clean it and you, you put get back to the pH that is good to put that material back to the patient. So you get your membranes and you do the mixture. And then you make the opiate denting block. Usually, as you cannot wait, this uh, material, if you are using it at the same time, you just look for a one-to-one -one ratio in volume. And then when you add this liquid thabinogen and you just add one or two cc's, then you get to that ratio of 60% of fibrin and only 40% of uh, biomaterial. Then you have one minute to give it the final shape and you finalize the extraction, you clean it very well. That's a, a key thing. You know, there's another topic that I don't have the time to talk today when we talk about M1, M2 macrophages and how, why you need to clean this very well, why you're gonna do this this way, minimally invasive. So you just clean everything and create this pouch or create this envelope where you are gonna place the, or you're gonna seal this socket with uh, the LPL membranes at the end. When is everything is clean, you take your denting block and you just put it in place. You have to condense it as you will do with any other biomaterial. But the good thing is, you know, this is very, uh, it's handling very well. And now we're gonna place this small piece of a dentin uh, block to be sure that we're gonna, you know, we get the new buckle plate that was missing there. And at the end, we seal the socket with LPRF membrane, nothing else. There is 
we can see here there is a minimally invasive surgery. Of course, if I will do this in a routinely daily basis, I would not use any biomaterial. I will only use LPNF as a soil graft. But you want to still use some kind of biomaterial and you have a tooth, well, use it if you want it. You will see the results that you can have. And this, uh, this is the end of the surgery. And you just place the sutures just to hold everything in place, not to attempt to close anything or get primary closure. So that was the uh, denting graph from the third molar. And there have been a, a few publications. Uh, Professor Bindemar from uh, Israel has done a wonderful job. He's one of the one is the leader in this uh, uh, technology and has shown that you can really clean the dentin particles with these uh, chemicals that you get with the kit. But we also wanted to uh, be sure of that and to do some analysis and we compare how effective was this uh, dentin cleanser versus uh, gamma radiation. So we did the study and you can see here, you have on your left the control uh, sample completely filled with a uh, full of uh, bacteria that uh, grow in there. And uh, the same sample with dentin cleanser, completely clean. And the same sample with gamma radiation on the right, completely clean. Uh, another tooth, another patient. So we repeat this several times. And then we send this also to an external company to get certified what is in there if this product was really free of uh, bacteria, fungi, and uh, yeast. And as you can see here, this is certified by a company. It says that it's, you know, it's a proof and it passed the test of sterility. So that's, that's very safe. And that gives you an idea that you can really work in a safe environment, in a sterile environment. As you would like. So why we use dentin? Well, uh, it could be a long story, but uh, to make a story short, dentin is one of the most closed biomaterial that you is more similar to bone. Uh, it has the same origin and the same component and the composition of dentin and bone are very, very close. So it's very, uh, and this is nothing new because this go back many, many years ago. The problem was that the technology to use it was not available until a few years, just, uh, uh, I don't know, five, six years ago that really started to, we really had the technology to do it this short side in our own offices. Uh, an affordable price or affordable cost. So when you look for the, the stology, what you will be looking for? Well, you will be looking for a, a new bone that is formed and um, it's uh, very, very uh, similar uh, or the bone is surrounded all these particles and it's very well attached. So that, that gives you an idea that, you know, we'll show you later the more histology and I'll give you more specific details on that, how it looks like and uh, what you should be expecting. So the, let's follow our case. We place the, the graph. So after three days, sutures should be loose because we, don't, we didn't want to place any pressure. That, this is an important tip and important thing. You don't put pressure when you do your sutures because uh, after three days, you can take them out, five days, no more than that. And this is how it looks like. The side after eight days, you see how it start to healing, how the LPRF is still there, how your fibrin is protecting the graft and allowing you know, the epithelium from the surrounding tissues to grow over the graph, not into the graph or uh, 
on the side of the graph into the socket. This epithelium that you can see here is growing over your grafted area. That's the most important thing. It's, this is only after 18 days. And you can see on your right, there's a specific filter to show everything in red is blood. So you have a huge amount of blood going through all this graft, and that's what you wanted. That's the basic number one rule thing when you do a graft. You need blood supply to the area. And after 30 days, you get complete closure of your uh, mucosa, and you can see there was not much shrink of the area, and you gain all this neocretinized tissue in that site. And after three months, all well, you still see, you know, that the site was very well preserved, and then you go back, and we will go back after three months, and we can see here that this is our graft. It looks very much the same as the bone. Well, I don't know if we still have in there too much particles of dentin, or you know there is new bone that has been formed. Well, both things. This is what it looks like on the X-ray, and we when we do the reentry, we can see here that the socket was completely filled with a new bo new bone. That is a new buckle plate formation. And we will place our implant a little bit to the buckle. Why? Because we wanted to really push this to the limit and see how this new bone that was formed here, you know, it was completely formed by dentin uh, behaves around the implant. So our implant will be in a good position, a little bit, you know, not to the palate, to the buckle, and to see how this new buckle play will behave in the future. And this is the histology that we will get from that side. And we can see here, we have the bone, we have dentin particles surrounded by bone, very well attached to the bone. This is what we call a microankylosis. So you can see that it's particles surrounded by bone, and you can see some areas where it's, this, it's going the resorption and a position of new bone at the same time. You can see this very nice uh, cut where you can see this dentin particle was cut with uh, in the other side of the um, And in this one, uh, you can see the dentin particles on your right and very well attached to the new bone, new bone that is vital. You can see the osteocyte and you can see the resorption and you can see the dentin tubules also that remain in there. So after three months, only three months, we have our implant. You can see the shape, the contour of the buccal aspect. And we can see the crown after a couple of years now. This is the first convinced CT after six months. And you can see the bone that is very well preserved on the buccal aspect. And this is the convinced CT after two years. So you still see this moderate and have a very nice looking buccal um, plate. Now we have this case, this is more challenging case because we can see this premolar and uh, we can see that we don't have almost any bone remaining. And beside that, uh, this, the apex of this premolar uh, get to the nasal fossa, not the maxillary sinus. So that gives you another challenge. So we have no bone on the buckle, a little bit of remaining bone on the palate, no bone in the apex, and the apex goes into the nasal fossa. So, and we have this beautiful premolar. What that, you know, because of a periodontal problem has to be extracted. So what you do here? Well, you can do many options. All the roads go to Roma, I used to say, and everybody said that. And, um, but 
can we do this in a minimally invasive approach in a very fast and predictable way? So let's say we will do this in one stage with no incisions and no external biomaterials. Everything will be 100% autologous. We will place the implant at the same time and we will deliver the final crown in four months. So we do the extraction and we clean the site very well. That is something that you always have to do. Look at this beautiful tooth that, you know, is almost, is almost completely healthy. And we also have to extract another teeth on the patient so we can get a lot of graft. We get like three to five grams of graft. We will make our, we will save that graft for another procedure for the patient, but we only will use uh, this small amount. And this time is about 0.5 cc. So we need, we still have like two or three cc left for future surgeries for this patient. And uh, we make the mixture, we make our L PRF dentin block, just as you have seen it before. Very fast, 20 seconds. You shape it in one minute and you have it ready to use it. Uh, now I'm shaping it, giving the shape that I want. It will remain in that shape for hours, it will not change in the following hours. Now we will use os densification drills to leave the sinus mucosa and we place LPRF membranes alone into the nasal fossa and we prepare the site. Even in the, those two and one millimeter of bone, we will anchor the, uh, our implant in the right position as you can see, prosthetically driven. And uh, we are adding more graphs. Now we are adding the LPRF dentin block to the side, a little bit into the pre uh, preparation for the implant. And of course, all we are compacting the graft on the buccal aspect. And now we are gonna place the implant. See, there is a minimally invasive surgery, just extraction, no incision. This is a flaplet. It has to be flapless to be successful. You cannot make a flap. You only raise a flap on the, like an envelope on the buccal aspect. Now you compact your bone on the buccal aspect and then you use LPRF membrane to seal everything and not to attain to get primary closure. So now is, this is the baseline and this is immediately after. You can see the implant going into the nasal fossa surrounded by LPRF dentin block and at the top, only LPRF membrane. After three months, you go back and this is what we can see. A new buccal plate, implant completely surrounded by bone, the nasal fossa is completely healthy and the mucosa is healthy and everything is ready to be restored. And then you can see these cases have been followed up for at least two years. And this is two years with provisional. That's what is all the stain of the acrylic that is in the provisional after two years follow-up. So another case, um, more uh, complex because now we are going into the sinus and we want to place an implant in a very, uh, at the edge of the socket. And the tooth that we extracted was very small. We have to clean it, the amalgam. So even this very small piece of tooth will give you 0.7 grams of graft. So again, you use your dentin cleanser and uh, you clean everything well, you disinfect it, you mix it. Then we prepare the side with the osteodentification drills to leave the sinus uh, mucosa we put the LPRF in place. So again, this is all 100% autologous. We are placing the LPRF membranes into the, the sinus. Now we are gonna place the implant at the edge of the socket 
that was remaining there. And this is very stable because of the osteodensification uh, procedure. Give you a very stable implant. And now we are gonna finalize all the surrounded area with the LPRF denting block. And since what, this was an extraction, we are not going for primary closure, but we are gonna seal and cover everything with the LPRF membranes and not to attempt to do any, that, that the molding incision, it was not really a flop. It was, it was only get to, to have access to the ridge and to get the implant in the right position. And you can see here, we leave this open and the suture, the only objective of the suture is to hold everything in place, not to attempt to get primary closure. And this is immediately the post-op, the Combin CT, you can see the LPRF on top of the implant and surrounding the implant. You can see the LPRF denting block around the, the implant. And this is how we start the baseline. Uh, four days later, suture can be taken out, don't need the suture anymore. So this is after three weeks, completely closure of the site and the epithelium is going on top of the graft on the socket. And after three months, we can go back and do uh, place our healing abutment. One month later, we can uh, place the final crown and you can see this is our, was our baseline on the left and on the right after three months. Uh, we have our uh, implant surrounded by bone all the way around. We don't want bone on top of the implant. We want bone around the implant, very stable after two years with the crown, final crown in place. So just to finalize now, uh, another topic today, another question is, well, should be this dentin uh, demineralized or should be using non-demineralized? So there is a, um, let's say a polemic issue about it. And um, so we did this split mouth study uh, on the sinus. <clears throat> One side, the same patient. On one side, we will do a sinus lift with demineralized dentin, and then the other side with non-demineralized dentin. And we will see the um, results. So you have this patient, and imagine, come, imagine how much graft can you get from these teeth? You are gonna have to extract many, many teeth, and they all look very nice. Maybe at this moment, they don't look too nice, but if, when they are grinded, I mean, when you see the particles, you don't, you forget all the bad things about these teeth. We have 14 teeth to be extracted. We are going to have 16, one, six, 16 grams of graft. If you want to make the calculation, how much money is that? Well, this will give enough graft to do both sinus, all the respiration at the frown, and also you can do some uh, vertical limitation on the lower. So this is how much graph you can get. And this is the sinus on the right, on the left. And this is the baseline on your left. Immediately after we put the PDF dentin block. And since six months later, you can see how and this is T2, uh, you can see the confidence CT, how the, now the graph is being consolidated and well, what is there? Well, if we do this tology, and this is the nicer thing, maybe because it's the sinus, I don't know, maybe because I, and I think that's my theory because it's mixes in this way, we didn't get a significant difference within non-demineralized versus demineralized dentin. Both sides were almost about exactly the same, same amount of bone, same behavior of the dentin particles. So you can see around here, same, uh, as you have seen before, all the particles surrounded by bone and new bone formation, enough bone to place the implant and all the implants that we placed were very uh, stable and 
with very good prognosis. So with that, uh, I, I will uh, finalize. Uh, the idea was not you know, to go in details on the techniques of everything, just to show you the concept that dentin is one of the safest products that you can use to do any type of bone graph and just a matter of how you use it and how you manipulate it. And if you do it right, if you learn it, how to use it, and I always recommend to take a course on everything that you, you see, you know, the, this concept of the LPRF block concept, the uh, denting graph, and how to do natural guided mineration. You have to go through the learning curve to get to successful result. result. But anyone that has done that uh, can say that uh, they have been very successful. Uh, Amit, I think uh, I will go back to you and um, I will um, see if there is any questions that I will be more than happy uh, to answer if I have the answer. Yeah, okay. So can you, can you hear me? Professor? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, so uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for it. Um, I'm always, <laughs> I'm always uh, finding new, new things uh, listening to you and definitely lots of new slides that I haven't seen before. So thanks very much for that. We had a bunch of questions as you were talking. I'm gonna to try to go back and, and, and uh, um, scroll to some of them. So uh, the one that just uh, was just asked, oh, I just lost it here. Uh, upon re-entry, uh, are, you, are you looking at uh, D2 bone or D1 bone? Or what can you say about the bone density and the bone type in general that you're finding after, after a uh, dentin grafting procedure uh, if if you have if you do a PRF dentin block because it, it has a lot of uh, fibrin so you have six, only 40 percent of graft I would say that your graft will feel like a d2 d3 uh, bone quality if you place only biomaterial and uh, you don't wait too much time, that could be very dense because the, the particles will remain. There will be many particles remaining. So it will be like uh, maybe uh, the hardness of the, the, the bone, maybe D1, D2, but uh, it's not that type of bone. It's just the density of the granules that are together and not resorbed yet. But if you wait enough time, you should usually find D2, D3 bone quality. We typically recommend to wait, if, if you're doing a non-immediate implant, we typically recommend three months uh, to wait before re-entry. Uh, what, what has been your experience? Have you been waiting longer or about three months? What can you say about that? I, I wait three months if I use the, if I mix it with the LPNF. If I don't use it with the LPRF, I try to, depends on the size of the graph or what type of graph you have done. You, I would suggest to wait between four to six months. Four to six months, okay, okay. Uh, now, a lot of people are asking, are you using just the root or are you using the crown, uh, basically the enamel with it as well? Are you separating them or not? No, just take the whole tooth and uh, grind it, everything enamel, uh, cement, denting. But remember that enamel is just a very small portion uh, of, of the tooth. So it will not matter. At the end of the day, it's only hydroxyapatite anyway, but a little bit more dense. And it will not do any harm in the side. And maybe uh, it, you will see it for a long, long time. If you take x-rays, you see those very small, tiny, uh, white dots and usually those are in animal particles that if you see in histology they mm -hmm. are surrounded by bone anyway but they will remain in the state in the side for a long time that will, will be the only difference we not resorb as fast as dentin right 
Right. Uh, okay. And we, we, by the way, we've seen both. We've seen people that take off, decoronate the crown and only use the root. Like you, we recommend to use the whole thing. Uh, now I, have never, I have never done that. I have always used the whole two. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and also we've seen some beautiful histological studies about the interface between enamel and bone, and they really, really look great. There's a very, very th fine line of cementum between the enamel and the bone that's forming, uh, and that shows you on, on nice communication between the, the enamel and the newly formed bone. So we are very, very happy with that. Um, there's a question about how do you cover the site? Uh, do you need to get to primary closure? Do you not need to get to primary closure? What type of membranes? I think I know the answer to that. Yeah. What are you going to say? <laughs> what type of membranes would you use? Would you use collagen membranes? Would you, would you use something else? So go ahead. I, I think that uh, I will use collagen membrane in a very specific indications, but 90% or more of the cases I will only use LPRF membrane, nothing else. So uh, for me, there's a, there is an evolution in uh, bone grafting and, uh, and uh, surgical procedures in the mouth that uh, we used to place uh, many type of uh, membranes in the past. I think the future for me is just going autologous most of the time. And I hope, uh, yeah, I would say 90% of the procedures, I will only use LPLF membranes. Mm -hmm. And if I can, of course, I can get, pri I, if, if I have primary closure, I, I will get primary closure, but if, I will not attempt to get primary closure if, uh, if, I using, uh, if I'm using LPLF membrane, I will leave them exposed. Yeah, and there's, uh, we're now working on some really interesting research, by the way, I'm not sure if I shared this with you, uh, some of it is, uh, is led by uh, Dr. Shnezana Paul, and uh, she's looking at invagination, invagination of soft tissue. And at least from the preliminary results that we're seeing, preliminary, okay, this was not published yet, uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, dentin doesn't, autologist, autologist dentin does not, uh, we don't see invagination of soft tissue into it, which is one of the main reasons why you would use membranes in the first place. So again, right. the study has to be completed, but we're seeing some beautiful results as far as not invaginating soft tissue into it. Yeah, which, which makes sense, uh, absolutely. And um, I, I think that the, all the work that the Jizana has been doing is great. So if she's around or she'll see this, uh, hello and uh, love your work and uh, keep, keep going because uh, she has done a wonderful work and she's still doing a wonderful work. Of course, not, 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 not just uh, Jizana, C. Mazor, or Robert Horowitz. Uh, there's a lot of people working in this field that are really doing a uh, great job. So this is something that is not just one person. You know, it's not, uh, I know Professor uh, Binderman from Israel was the, the, one of the first ones to start with this, but Today, this this is this go worldwide. So, uh, oh, I see it. Jizana is around. So, love you. Big hit for you, and um, hope to see you soon. Hope to, hope your. I really wish your congress in uh, in um, divas for dentists will go on. I will be there for sure. I think. Let's see. Hopefully. So uh, there, is, there, there is a work for, I mean, there's a, many people around doing this, good people, good clinicians, and a nice researcher. So uh, yeah, there is, I think there is enough evidence to really work with uh, this in a safe way. Okay, Let's put okay. It that way. By the way, Sandra, I think Sandra from Brazil is saying hello, and she's enjoying the lecture very much. Um, Big kiss for you, Sandra, too. Question here about uh, storing the dentin if you have leftover. Okay, so let's say you ground up a molar. Typically, you would have about two to three cc's of graft. You would use one, 1 1.5. You still have one cc left. You know the patient is coming back for the implant in three months or in four months, and you might need some of this great autologous dentin for, for, for this patient. Um, how would you store it? 
Well, I I have my like, like my own uh, bank now at the office. I keep it in my office. I ask I ask the patient if if they want to keep it, but they say I will lose it. So so why don't you keep it? And I will I will I will save it. Uh, sterile. I do the last, I mean, the complete sterilization process, and then I just keep it, you know, and, uh, and um, I seal it in a small bag and then his own uh, that uh, glass jar that comes with the kit. And I just put the name of the patient, the date, and everything, all the, the reference, and I just keep it, you know, in uh, room temperature and uh, clean. Uh, uh, area and that's it. Actually, I have all my my son's third molars grinded. I mean, they all have it. Just just in case, you never know for the future. So yeah. this this will last for almost forever. I think uh, somebody said it's a two hundred years expiration uh, date. So <laughs> yeah, more than enough time to to use it. And we have used it like like the case I show you. You know, we got sixteen grams. Of, uh, of graft and we use it several times. We use it for the sinus, we use it for, you know, any, any other procedure or the implant that the, the implant, I mean, the patient needed. So yeah. we reuse it all the yeah. time. So you can, you take as much as you need and you just save the rest. And that's the nicest thing. I don't think there is any graft in the world that you can do that, you know, just take whatever you want and save the rest. And then, of course, you have to go through the procedure of uh, re-disinfection or re-esterilization oh. every time you use it. Exactly. That's very, very important. Uh, we have specific procedures, protocols for that on the website. So again, you just mentioned it, but again, if you're saving the graft for future use, whether you're giving it to the patient to keep or you're keeping it for them, when they come back, it's very, very important. You have to re repeat the whole cleansing process. You want to make sure that you know, whatever, for as long as it was sitting there, you're repeating the cleanser, dent dentin cleanser for five minutes, and you're washing it with the PBS a couple of times just to make, just, you know, just to make uh, sure. Um, now, there's also an option. Sometimes you extract a tooth and you're not grafting in the same session for many different reasons. You can clean up the tooth mechanically and you can save and store the tooth as well. Just store it dry. Room temperature uh, is fine. And I think that was the question was just, just came in. Is it yeah, possible? I, uh, possible? I have done, sorry, I have done both, both way. I have, you know, sometimes I just get the, the teeth, especially from my students at the university. They extract the teeth, they give it to me. I grind it, I prepare the graph, then I send the graph back to them. So they will reuse it uh, later. And uh, yeah, just say the clean the tooth and uh, put it in a dry environment and just uh, use it. And don't recommend to use uh, um, oxygen peroxide or or chlorhexidine. Right. Not not to put it in those type of. Uh, there is no need to put it in, in those type of um, uh, solutions. Uh, if you want to use some, just alcohol. Just leave it in alcohol. That will do it. I mean, they will clean it and will dehydrate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we'll take just a couple more questions. Uh, the dishes, the uh, deciduous teeth. Okay, baby teeth. Yeah, you can use baby teeth. Uh, the only thing is keep in mind that baby teeth, again, for the same patient, not in the family. You don't transfer it in the fam between family members. Uh, for the same patient, just keep in mind baby teeth are small. And so you're not going to get as much graft out of them because they're much smaller than, uh, than uh, you know. Uh, right, um, and, and then so they, usually, you know, the, the, the roots are reserved. So the amount of dentin really, the, where the big amount of dentin is, is being resorbing. So, so if you get a, a, a really uh, deciduous teeth with a known resorber um, and root, yeah, of course you will get more graft. But uh, if not, probably you will end with a, just a, a very small amount of graft. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, a question from Dr. Marcio Formiga. Uh, uh, he's asking whether uh, you can actually use the dentin graft without LPRF or without PRF in general. 
and just mix it up with saline or not mix it at all, mix it with the blood or not at all. And yeah, absolutely you can, Nelson. Yeah, it's just, it's just a graft. I mean, you have to consider this as, uh, as a, any other graft. So you can, you can mix it, you can use it with autologous bone, you can use it alone, you can use whatever technique you feel confident with it. So not a problem, it just, but think, the, the question is if you can think that uh, dent, autologous dentin can be, you know, placed uh, uh, or can be used as a, any other biomaterial form of grafting. That's the question and the question is yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think that's going to be the last one. Uh, no, I think that's actually a comment from uh, Professor uh, Marius Lertel, a good friend of mine. Hi, Marius. Good, good to have you here. Uh, Marius is from Romania. Thanks very much for joining us. He yeah. was commenting on the side from chat, on the chat bar to a uh, few of the questions as well. So great. Thanks very much for your input. Uh, Nelson, I think we're pre pretty much going to be finished here. We're over the time anyways. Um, last question and that's it. Can I mix with other, if I don't have enough, can I mix it with other allografts or alloplasts? Is that, an, is that gonna be an issue? No, no, not at all. It, it just try to stay in the same uh, resorption rate or try to use, you know, the, I will suggest first allograph and then to mix it with some kind of a uh, xenograph, but uh, uh, I will, my first option will be uh, an allograph. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, resorption rate. So I'm just going to reiterate things that you've said and said before. The dentin, the nice thing, we, we think that one of the greatest things about dentin graft is that it resorbs slowly. It resorbs slowly over time. And not only that lets the bone to replace it with the native natural bone, but the, the big thing here is that it supports the new bone that you regenerated as a great long-term scaffold. And so your, all your new bone, your woven bone, your, your premature, immature bone has enough sufficient time to become lamellar, lamellar bone and go into its natural self-support of replacement resorption phase. And uh, that's, that's a, in, in general, that, those are the type of grafts you, you would wanna use. Grafts that are resorbing, that are, you know, that, that are turning over for sure, you want to end up with native bone, but they're doing it slowly. So they're really supporting the newly regenerated bone into a mature lamellar bone. Okay, so lots of people here are sending you their regards and uh, saying how much they enjoyed the lecture once again. Uh, and uh, Nelson, it's, it's been really been a pleasure uh, having you here. Thank you uh, very much. Thanks again. And I really, really hope we'll, we're going to get the chance to, to meet in person, face to face. Uh, very I early. really hope so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye for Bye. Now.